throughout those times, he's been extremely productive. I think 26 publications so far, but there are several that are in review or re-review right now, so that number may have increased uh, in the last hopefully. few weeks, or hopefully. Um, what's pretty amazing is throughout that voyage, he's really focused on a very specific set of questions, which is understanding neurodegeneration and cell death uh, in a variety of neurodegenerative diseases, most of which have really focused on Alzheimer's. And he's attacked this question in a dish, looking at compounds and drugs that can prevent cell death, prevent excited toxicity. He's looked at it from the uh, perspective of a glial cell biologist, trying to understand how microglia can attack uh, A beta uh, fibrils. And most recently, he has uh, turned to mouse genetics and human samples to get at some cell specificity uh, in regards to the disease pathology. And so I'll just comment a little bit about that. There's been uh, quite a controversy in the field about um, tau accumulation and, and the pathological accumulation of tau in a variety of cell types. And uh, it has been thought over the last few years that many cell types can actually accumulate this pathological tau. And what Harry has found is that it's not actually true. It's that a very specific subset of cells in the brain accumulate tau, and it's a certain type of neuron, excitatory neurons. And so he's really starting to build his career over the cell-specific vulnerability of excitatory neurons. Uh, and so that's culminated in a recent neuron paper, uh, and it's really going to be what sh pushes his, him forward to his individual uh, independent career, and he's already gotten a KO1 award from the, from the National Institute on Aging to study this, and also an Alzheimer's Association uh, fellowship or award uh, to study this. So he's well on his way uh, on this path forward to understand how individual cell types in the brain are affected by cell. So we're very grateful that you're here, and so let's, let's give our uh, candidate a warm welcome. Can you hear me, everyone? Yeah. So first, I want to thank Dr. Fox for a very kind introduction, and also uh, thank the search committee member for inviting me here. Uh, I'm very glad here uh, to be here, and then I have met few faculty members and then talk about science in the morning, and then I'm looking forward to collaboration in the future. And then I'm looking also looking forward to meet more people today and tomorrow. Uh, so. Today I'm going to share with you uh, some, of, uh, some of my findings when I was uh, associate research scientist in Doc's current staff lab. And uh, the second part is my independent project. Uh, and then the last part I'll give you an overview of my future plans. And then I always interested in which sub subtype of neurons are vulnerable in the Alzheimer's disease, and then particular to tau pathology, which is the main uh, pathological hallmarks in Alzheimer's disease. Before that, I'll give you an overview of a neurodegenerative disease. Uh, in the audience, several PI also do the, uh, some uh, work, for example, ARS work. And we know there's an current, unfortunately, there's no uh, uh, neuroprotective or disease altering treatment for this neurodegenerative disease. Uh, but they share a common feature. They have protein aggregation. For example, in Alzheimer's, oops, sorry. Let's get used to this. So for in Alzheimer's disease, they have an extracellular, uh, a beta from the C9 plaques, uh, and the intraneuronal tau from the neurofibular tangles. And this uh, tau protein aggregation has also been found in a group of uh, tau-related uh, disease called tauopsis including the frontal temporal dementia. And alpha cynically in Parkinson's disease and FAST and TDB43 in ALS and the FTD disease. And then very recently, the C9 uh, open reading frame, frame 72 caused a, mut a mutation caused a dipeptide repeat protein aggregates has also been found in ALS and FTD patients, uh, as well as SOD protein aggregates in ALS and uh, Huntington in the Huntington disease. This is just to give you what the protein aggregates look like in this neurodegenerative disease. This is the extracellular C9 plaques, and this is an intraneuronal neurofibular tangles in Alzheimer's disease. 
This is the Lewis body in Parkinson's disease. This is the Huntington uh, intranuclear uh, inclusions as well as uh, protein aggregates in ARS and uh, extracellular prion amyloid plaques. Although they have a specific uh, protein composition in different protein aggregate, they share a common uh, structure and a uh, electron microscope. They uh, looks like this. It's a, a fibular polymers, and then this protein aggregation followed a nucleation process, and then that is from the start from the monomer and uh, from dimer, oligomer, and finally you will, uh, they form the big protein aggregates seen in those disease. Although the exact form of the uh, protein and caused neurodegeneration is not clear yet. So in terms of the cell type involved in the uh, pathogenesis in this disease, uh, besides the common activation of uh, astrocytes and microglia and oligodendrocytes, uh, they have a specific neuronal population uh, affected in this disease. For example, in Alzheimer's disease, they, they mainly affect the cortical and the hippocampal neurons, especially the antirrhinal cortex layer two and layer three neurons, and the CA1 pyramidal neurons. And in Parkinson's disease, they mainly affect the dopergic neurons. And Huntington disease affect the striatal neurons, while AAS uh, disease, they mainly affect the motor neurons. So one of the fundamental questions um, common to all of the neurodegenerative disease is uh, why a particular disease target a specific neuronal population. So let's look at the uh, distribu distribution of the pathological hallmarks of um, uh, Alzheimer's disease again, as I mentioned before. This is the CNI plaques, and this is the neurofibular tangles formed by tau. And then the distribution of the CNI plaques is, broad, is a pr pretty broad. They at the, even at the early stage, they already cover the most uh, cortex region. And then the middle stage, they spread into the uh, subnuclei and the motor cortex and then later to the cerebellum and brainstem. However, the neurofibular tangle, the distribution follows a well-defined and uh, follow the anatomic uh, connection. They originate in the lucus cordus and the antirrhinal cortex, and then spread into the limbic system, including the hippocampus, and then at later stage to spread into the neocortex. And, and then at that late stage, and they cause they associated with the cognitive deficits. So just to remember this region, antirrhinal cortex, I will mention many times in my following talks. So to replicate or mimic the tau distribution in human AD, uh, Dr. Cameron Duff's lab generated a mouse line we call EC tau line. This is a uh, human mutant tau, is a P301L, predominantly expressed in the EC, the, the region I mentioned uh, before is early affected in Alzheimer's disease and then using the neuropsin promoter. And then they characterize at the early stage, most of tau uh, staining are located at the axon and they are diffused axon staining in the MEC, the medial antirrhinal cortex and the lateral antirrhinal cortex as well as the uh, axonal terminal following the perforant pathway in the middle molecular layer of dendy gyrus and the CA1 and the CS3 superficial layer. When you look at the middle age, you see those axonal staining disappeared. And then instead they have more granular cell body and the soma, soma, uh, somatodendritic tau staining. This in indicated the mature tau staining. And also you see they spread into a little bit deeper layer of the EC region and also the granular layer of the dentate gyrus and the pyramidal cells of the CA1 neurons. So when I took over the project, I further characterized this line. At a very aged mouse, they are at a 34 month age. And then I look at the particular neocortex region because this region is a, the latest stage uh, in Alzheimer's disease. They have a lot of build up tar pathology. And then indeed, I found they have a significant cell body tau staining uh, in this region. And then instead of, uh, we cut many sections and uh, do the staining, a bunch of staining, 
and then this is a kind of tedious uh, laborious work and then you can and uh, you visualize the tau distribution in 3d way at one time using a method at the, in, in, our, in my study I use an I disco class method this method is a similar is similar to the clarity you, you guys may be familiar with that it's to make the brain transparent so basically is a you isolate the brain fix them and then just do the immunostaining as you did for regular immunostaining, but just a longer incubation time. And then you using 3 disco clearing method to clear the brain, make it transparent, and then using the light sheet microscope to, uh, to scan it, and then using our merit software to do the 3D reconstruction. And then you will uh, see, looks like this. This is a snapshot of the 3D image, and then at early stage, they both axonal staining at the EC and dentigerous middle molecular layer. And then this white box indicating those uh, uh, aggregate granular uh, tau staining. If we're using the super color to indicate those regions with uh, tau, and then you can clearly see the distribution and from the MEC DG to the uh, late neural cortex region and even to the uh, anterior effector bulb region. And I just give you two uh, movies to show the early uh, stage stained by human specific tau and uh, also the late stage. So this is the early stage. You see that you have the external staining in the MEC, a little bit in the amygdala region indicated by the blue color. And then when you look at the aged EC tau mouse, you see a lot of granular staining tau staining and then spread into the neural cortex and the anterior factor bound and also those blue is the uh, amygdala region. So also you can use this method to visualize the tau pathology with gliosis at the same time as shown um, by this movie. So the green stands for the tau staining and then the red is the stand by the IBA1 and which is specific for microglia and macrophage. And then you see those microglia just surrounding those tau pathology. Of course, you can use this method to do like a, a, the transsynaptic tracing study. And then you can also look at the brain circuitry, map, map the brain circuitry. Also for us, for the neurodegenerative disease, we are particularly interested to see how tau spreading or apocynically in Parkinson's disease spreading from one area to another area. So the second character of this mouse line is the gliosis. So we look at the MEC region, the medial temporal and the cortex is the early effect in the autonomous disease. And this is a tau staining, just focus on the MEC region. And using the IBA1 to stand for the microglia. And then you see at 24 months, the number of microglia significantly enhanced. And then we're using a more specific activated microglia marker, CD68, to, to see the, how it looks like as mouse aged. And then we see microglia start to activate as early as 14 months age. At this age, I should mention, they have no neuronal loss at all. The pattern is pretty similar in, uh, in our line. And then for this study, I'm using 10 animals each group, each age. So it's uh, not like a 50, but uh, it's a pretty consistent for the distribution so pattern. You mean the 3D movie? Yeah. yeah. You can do that. Yeah, that can, yeah, that would be better. But at that time, we just uh, did a few. We, and then we rushed for publication for grant, I think. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, but for this, we do a lot of characterization it's called the quantification data for this. It's a pretty consistent in the MEC region. And then the top pathology may be vary a little bit in the neural cortex, but you do see this spread into that region a lot compared with the young age. Yeah. So this line is a pretty stable, actually, surprisingly. Yeah. So also we're using the GFAP to stain the astrocyte. We saw similar uh, phenomenon. They activated as early as uh, 14 months, and then they further activate at the later stage. So this indicating that the progressive glosis is associated with the TAR pathology in the MEC uh, region in the EC TAR mouse. So this is considered uh, consistent with the previous publication that uh, indicating that gliosis is not just outcome of the neuronal loss. They may play a role in the early stage the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. So the third model, a third character of this line is the memory deficit. First, we're using a traditional morris watt maze to test the spatial memory. And at the beginning, you just let the mouse to learn how to find, uh, to find the hidden platform. And after several trials, the mouse should be directly go straight to the platform. And then that means they are learning and then you can compare different genotypes to see what looks they performed. And then at the early stage, 14 months, we didn't see difference between EC and uh, control mice. However, at the age, this is the control, this is the EC tau mouse. You see, they take much longer to find those hidden platforms, indicating that some problem with the learning process. And then two hour, uh, sorry, 24 hour after remove the hidden platform, and then you let the mouse swim, and then go, straight, uh, go to the uh, target quadrant with the hidden platform, and then you record how many times they crossing the hidden platform. That's indicating the, the long-term memory. And then, again, at young age, we didn't see big difference. And then at late stage, the EC tau mouse do have significant memory deficit. Then we test, uh, we want to confirm this special memory uh, deficit using another test. This is a T test, I see. And then this is the basic setup. This is the stem, and this is the left arm and the right arm. As to test the special memory, we personally uh, purposely block this right arm and then force the mice, mice go to the left arm with black cues. And then the next try, you just put the mask here, but don't let them see the arm, just face back and then let them to choose which side to go. And then due to the nature of the mammals, and then they should, they have a spontaneous uh, alternation, and then they should go to the right side. And then you, if they go to the right side, that indicate a correct choice. But if they do go to the left arm, that's the wrong choice. So then we'll calculate the how many correct choice they made. And then again, at 14 months, no difference. At uh, uh, aged EC time hours, they performed Worse compared with the uh, control mice. Yeah. Yeah. Is there? We have a middle. Yeah. We we do have a middle age, and then they have a trend, but not reach significant yet. So this is the may it may mimic the human is that you need the tau spread into the neural cortex region, and then you have a memory cognitive deficit. So it is consistent with the, the phenomenon of human. Yeah. Yeah, you are correct, but this line, if you look at the the tau uh, using psi, psi flexing S, which is stand for the mature tau. And then they, they are not positive for the neural cortex region. And then they're only co uh, positive for the MEC region. And then indicating that though, although they have a distribution of tau, but they are not a total aggregate into maybe toxic form yet. So that's why we think maybe those are toxic, the aggregate tau may be more toxic, although they, they the debate of uh, oligomer or fever tau is a more toxic 
but this, this may explain why we didn't see a, at the middle age. I mean, we only found it in the late stage, although this is a, at the end of the lifespan of the mice, but it is still, in terms of pathology, still relatively early. It's a comparable with a human. That's my mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, that, uh, yeah, I should mention, that mutation not found in human Alzheimer's disease. This is found in the uh, frontal temporal dementia. Uh, in our field, we use that as a model, mutation to, call, to generate the marks to see how tau uh, spreading or the toxicity of tau. But no mutation has been found in the, uh, of tau in human AD yet. Although some locus close to that region maybe have some variant indicating that, but uh, no confirmation yet. Uh, so the anterior cortex and the hippocampus are two main uh, regions involved in the spatial memory. And this is a grid cell in the anterior cortex region discovered by Dr. Moses' uh, group, and the play cell in the hippocampus region discovered by Dr. O'Keefe, and then they shared the Nobel Prize in 2014. And these two types of excitatory neurons and they contribute the brain GPS system and then the involved in the spatial navigation. So in our study, uh, we collaborated with Dr. Hassanai at our university to look at the grid cell activity. This is the first time, I think, uh, to report uh, the grid cell activity in the tau mouse model. And basically, he, uh, he made those tetrodes and then attached the microdrive and the head stage gear and then connected to pre-amplifier to can amplify the signal and then reduce the signal noise. And then through the amplification and the filter process, and then they give the software to distinguish the spike clustering and then can distinguish different cell types. And then in our study, we focused on the MEC region, especially dorsal MEC region, uh, which has been suggested to be a significant effect by top pathology. And then this is the the setup of his uh, recording system. So basically you have the, those the tetra to attach the head, and also this the light actually is uh, combined with the optogenetic uh, uh, setup. Uh, you can regulate the brain activity at the same time, but not in our study. So I just give, uh, show you a movie what the uh, grid cell firing uh, looks like. So this is a single grid cell. And then when the mouse is exploring a box, and then this cell can fire in at a different places. And when you connect this, uh, the center of the firing map, and then you, they form a triangular grid pattern. They call it grid field. And then when you do the autocorrelation, you get this map, and then you can calculate the grid score uh, to measure the spatial symmetry uh, of the grid pattern. So this is the data we got. And then when we compare the aged EC tau mouse uh, con with, with control, and then you can appreciate the grid pattern significantly messed up with co compared with control. And then you look at the average uh, grid score uh, in the aged EC tau mouse, significantly lower than control, but not at a young age. And also the distribution of the grid score uh, most uh, lower score at the aged EC tau mouse. How about the firing rate? And then we look at the peak firing and the average firing rate, and, and we found both significantly reduced uh, at the EC tau mouse, at aged, uh, at the 30 plus months. And then how about the inhibitory neurons? And we found the average firing rate significantly enhanced. We assume this is due to the uh, deficits of the excitatory neurons cause the feedback constraint of inhibitory neurons. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. We test, we
30 months is around 80 human, around a few. Yeah, 80 years old. Yeah, we do test uh, this. Uh, for this particular in vivo recording, they do reduce the reduction of the brain cell activity the same. Uh, we test is around 24. It's a middle. Yeah, so this is a between that, but we didn't put it in this uh, paper. Yeah, because the one review also asked that question, because that's easily you you see the early and then later why you didn't test the middle. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. So this we we are first to identify the gray cell activity significantly reduced in the MEC in aged EC tau mass. So the in vivo single unit recording data suggest that tau pathology caused the imbalance between excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And then we are wondering what type of neurons are impacted by a pathological tau. So we look at the MEC again, and then we do the sequential staining of neuronal marker uh, uh, MAP2 and the tau, human tau specific antibody MC1, and then we found the perfect colorization indicated by those uh, black arrows. When we look at the marker clear, and then we didn't find the colorization at all. And then we look at the astrocyte, there are very few colorization. And this is a very consistent with the previous publication, indicating that the pathological tau co-localize with neurons but not glial cells uh, in the early stage of MEC of HEC tau mice. But this uh, no co-localization no does not mean the microglia or extra does not play any role in the process of the Alzheimer's disease. Maybe those neurons, uh, those the glial cells can degrade those um, uh, tau aggregation quickly so that we didn't find it or they, they through secreting enzyme to degrade them extracellularly. So. Uh, we haven't tested it uh, completely but uh, we saw they do have express in the neurons and, and microglia haven't tested yet. According to that group, the Mayo Clinic, they generate this mice, then they, they think it's not just a neuron node. Yeah, but I don't have the data for that, yeah. But I, I like to see using my single fish assay <laughs> later. And then we further dig into this question, which is the excitatory neuronal marker, and TBR1 is the same for the nuclei of excitatory neurons and then look at the colocalization, and we found tau colocalized very well with the excitatory neuronal markers. And then we choose the pavlovian and the somatostatin as the inhibitory neuron markers, and then we didn't find colocalization at all. I, I should mention I do the sequential staining, and then not co-staining. If you do co-staining, you will see perfect colocalization with somatostatin. That's my original finding. And then I realized why it looks perfect. And then I using sequential staining to test it again. Actually, the opposite result. That's a little another story. At the beginning, I thought it's inhibitory, but now it turned into excitatory. So you should be careful with the uh, co-staining when you do the tau staining, particularly. So when you look at the number of TBR1, you saw the at MEC layer two and the layer three and the layer four region, uh, the, the number of TBR1 is significantly reduced. But the inhibitory neuronal marker, uh, no difference between control and EC tau mice. So this is not the number of excited neurons, but, inhibited, but not inhibited neurons is reduced in the MEC of aged EC tau mice. Then we look, further look at this the second spreading area, like uh, perirhinal cortex, and uh, neocortex region. This time we include uh, one more excitatory neuronal markers because we are worried this uh, excitatory neuron cannot cover most uh, uh, excitatory neurons. This is another marker. It's also stained the nuclei of an excitatory neuron. And then we, again, we found perfect colorization with the excitatory neurons. But when you're using the 
This time we're using three inhibitory neurons, which according to previous publications should cover over 95% of inhibitory neurons. And then we found none of them colocalized with the tau. That's extracellular recording, yeah. So what characteristics would you say that's an inhibitory? They based on the, I'm not expert on that, so but I think they based on the frequency and the, the, the amplitude, right? And then to distinguish the exogenous inhibitory, but I'm not exactly know that. Yeah, We thought it uh, caused the feedback is because the inhibit saturated really lower and then relative the inhibitory neurons still number didn't change, that's caused the so what's what's making the speed of the inhibitory neurons fire at a higher rate? That I we think it just the balance change, we don't know exactly. But um, in the future we can do specifically express tau in the saturated and the inhibitory neurons and to see whether they really affect affect those the different types of neurons. Yeah. So can okay, maybe is the idea that the tau you're showing for local I think with the excitatory neurons is actually contributing to the decreased firing capacity of the excitatory neurons. Yeah. Is it possible? We think that okay. so. and so you're, and you're not showing the tau in the inhibitory neurons, correct? Yeah, they we didn't find right. it. But if you for it, think about this, if you have less saturated neuron, right, and then you have the relative more inhibitory neuron now, right? The inhibitory neuron will inhibit the saturated neuron, right? Cause feedback. So that's maybe that's why you see the like a compensatory effect of the inhibitory. But I don't know exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can maybe ask more about that with Abby. Answer your question later. Thank you. So, when we look at the uh, the ratio of colocalization, we found that over 90% colocalized with the saturated neurons, but the very few colocalization with the inhibitory neurons is less than 1%. And then, if you look at the number of saturated neurons, again at the MEC region, and then at the HEC tau mouse, the number significantly reduced but not for the inhibitory neurons. And also we exclude the aging effect. And when by comparing the uh, Y type mice, the 22 and the 30 plus months, and then we didn't find significant difference between TBR1 and SATP2 numbers. So this is a reduction due to tau, not due to the aging effect. So how about in human? And then we get the human brain section from the brain banks, and then we look at the this is a uh, this is a blue region is a hippocampus. This is a temporal lobe, and then including this uh, anterior cortex region. And then again, we using the same excitatory neuronal marker TBR1 and SATB2. Yeah, that's a good question. For most of my study, I show the MC1, that's uh, generated by Dr. Peter Davis, is a conformational and also recognize the phosphorylation tau. But uh, we also do a lot, a bunch of tau specific antibodies, phosphor tau antibody, for example, H8, 8100, and phosphor serine 422. 
a dead antibody, we get a similar result. This is a human human tongue. You mean the inhibitory neuron? They didn't express tongue. Uh, I will show the fish data later. They do express. Yeah. So again, we look at the colloquialization. We found the perfect. The perfect colloquize with the excitatory neurons, but non, uh, not uh, colloquize with the inhibitory neurons. Again, this is the quantitative data. Over 90% colloquize with the inhibitory, excitatory neurons, but less than 1% colloquize with inhibitory neurons. As the tau expression level enhanced at the middle and the late stage, and you will see the number of excitatory neurons significantly reduced. So indicating that the excitatory neurons and the inhibiting neurons in humans also differentially vulnerable to tar pathology in the early affected region in AD brain. So the summary for the first part is that mature tar pathology is associated with the gliosis, grid cell dysfunction, and the special memory deficits in the HEC tar mouse. And then excitatory and the inhibitory neurons are differentially vulnerable to accumulation of pathological tau. And then it not in both human brains and also our mouse model. And then excitatory neurons are vulnerable to pathological tau in both the early and the late uh, affected regions in AD. So the next part is my independent project. Yeah, that's a good question. I didn't show, but in my publication, we're using the amino fish to double staining the tau, human tau protein with messenger tau RNA. And then you will see the, in those the spreading area, they have very few endogenous MRN level, mostly just uh, human tau. That's indicating they are spreading human tau, not due to the endogenous level. Yeah. If you're interested, you can look at the, the plus one paper, I think, yeah. So uh, we know that the protein homostasis network can maintain a functional protein. And then the newly, the nascent and folded protein generates in the ribosome and are released and uh, folded uh, into functional protein to exert its function. Those unnecessary or extra protein can be degraded in the proteasome or lysosome. During aging or and the stress condition or environment factor caused stress, and then those protein can be misfolded uh, and further aggreg aggregate into the big protein aggregate. And then likely most time, our body have a uh, homostasis network can regulate, can unfolded, unfolded those uh, and misfolded protein or send it to the lysosome or proteasome for degradation. And then I'm particularly interested in the upstream, the misfolded protein, and then whether they have a uh, intrinsic difference between excitatory and the inhibitory neurons. And then this is the idea is the, uh, based on the funding from one group in the University of Cambridge, actually my collaboration, collaborators. And then they found they are, sub, they are a group of subsaturated protein. They are much higher level. Compare uh, high concentration compared their solubility, and then in the aging and the neurodegeneration, this is much higher. Uh, this group protein compared with the uh, healthy brain, and then they named this group uh, protein uh, as the metastable subprotein, MS in short. I will mention later in my uh, data, and then they further compared the different, uh, different cell types in terms of those uh, proteostasis signature. And then they found in the neurons, they have much less protectors. That's the protein aggregation protectors. But they have much higher promoters and A beta and tau level. So I collaborated with them to look at the 
a further look at the subtype of neurons, excitatory and inhibitory neurons, whether they have the same or similar signature uh, difference between the different subtypes of neurons. So we took the advantage of two recently published uh, single nucleus ion seq data set, and then those data set from the healthy donors, they don't have any uh, AD or Parkinson disease and uh, other disease of protein aggregation. This is a very early stage. And then the first data set uh, we, we called uh, SNS. And then they isolate the uh, nuclei from the uh, er, early affected region, temporal cortex, and uh, uh, also the frontal cortex, and uh, the very late stage affected area is the primary viral cortex. And then they stain the nuclei with new N, specific neuronal marker, and the DAPI, general nuclear uh, staining. And then they do the fact sorting, and then they using the C1 and microfluidics to separate into single nuclei, and then they do the RNA sequencing. And then they are able to identify eight different subtypes of excitatory neurons and eight different subtypes of excitatory neurons, indicating that the neurons are highly heterogeneous. And another data set is from Dr. Aviv Rigger group uh, in Broad Institute. And then they combine the drop C, uh, drop lead technique with the single nuclear ion seq technique. Basically, they isolate the uh, nuclei from the early affected region. This time, it is the hippocampal region. And then the, the relative late stage uh, affected area is the prefrontal cortex. And then they using the drop lead technique to separate the single nuclei and then do the sequencing. And then they are able to identify different cell type too. So we can analyze these uh, uh, two data sets. First, we look at the uh, just to compare excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons in general, and then uh, we found that this uh, uh, tau aggregation promoters and the MS stands for the metastable subprotein uh, gene signature significantly higher in the excitatory neurons. And then this is a transcriptome uh, gene signature, the whole transcriptome used as a reference control. And then we found, also found the protectors significantly lower in excitatory neurons. And also this is as a control. You see the excitatory have much higher excitatory neuron markers, but much less in inhibitory neuron markers. We are also able to replicate our data, set, uh, data uh, finding in the another independent data set. And you see here promoters MS significantly enhanced. So this is a, a data set analysis that reveals a specific tau homostasis signature in the excitatory neurons in the human brains indicate they may contribute to the excitatory neuronal vulnerability. Then we further look at the different region, the early effect region and the later effect region. And then again, we found the MS and the tangles is the uh, uh, tau co-aggregators. And then they're significantly higher in the early affected regions compared with the later region. And then we are able to replicate the data uh, Similarly, you see here enhanced uh, tangles and MS. And also the pro protectors are actually in this data set uh, significantly lower uh, in the early affected regions. But when you look at the tau, you will appreciate they have uh, opposite direction, right? So this is uh, due to the region we compare. As I mentioned before, this early region is the uh, uh, temporal cortex and the prefrontal and the frontal cortex. And the latest affect every area is the primary visual cortex. And here, early is the hippocampal region. And then the, this late, relative late is the prefrontal cortex because we cannot get identical regions for comparison. We have to do this. So that's why, in general, the frontal cortex might have higher levels of uh, tau compared with the le relative later affected regions. That's why it causes a, a different, different trend here. So this is uh, the can uh, contribute to the regional vulnerability. So I further using the single molecule uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization assay. Uh, this is the method called ion scope uh, developed by this SED company. Basically, you formulize your cells on section, and then you hybridize with uh, their customer, customized uh, called double Z probe, and then through a series of amplification process, 
and then you are able to uh, visualize your single uh, messenger RNA in particular cells. And then you can use in the software, for example, ImageJ, to quantify them. So let's first look at the fir uh, early effect region, EC. And then I choose uh, four genes from data set analysis. The first one is the uh, MAPT, is the microtubule associated protein that encoding the tau itself. And then MAPK1 is the tau co-aggregators. And then FKBP5 is belong to the gene data set uh, of a tau aggregation promoter. And then this is the ENC1 belong to the metastable subprotein gene. We designed the probes and then do the uh, fish assay. And then we, we do the close staining of these th three probes at the same time. This is target probe from this four uh, gene. And this is saturated neuronal probe, SLC17A7. This is the inhibitory neuronal marker probe, GET1. And then you will found, uh, in terms of tau level, they don't have big difference. But you, you will look at the MK, uh, MAPK1, the level is significantly higher in excitatory neurons compared with the inhibitory neurons. And the same as the, uh, same for the FKBP5 and also ENC1. If you look at the quantitative data, you can quantify how many single uh, messenger RNA in the in excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons. We found that they have significantly high level in the excitatory neurons. So we also look at the late affection region in human uh, prefrontal cortex. We're using the same strategy and then using the same four probes and then look at the localization, uh, localization and the messenger ion expression in excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And then again, the tau level itself, no big difference. And then when you look at the MAPK1, FKBB5, and the ENC1, they're significantly higher in the excitatory neurons although the level is relatively lower compared with the early stage. So for the take home message for this part of the story is that excitatory neurons are more vulnerable, uh, more susceptible to dysregulate protein homostasis uh, that affects the tau aggregation. We call this the tau homostasis. And in the human brain, the region is affected by tauopsy early in the disease were more likely to be susceptible to dysregulated tau homostasis in regions impacted late in the disease. And the dysregulation of a specific branch of the homo protein homostasis uh, may play an important role in the initiation and the spreading of the uh, tau pathogenesis in AD and the related tau -opsy. So in the last few minutes, I want to uh, talk about my future plan so the first project is based on my founding on the uh, group of a subtype of neurons. They express in the WF1 gene, and then they are vulnerable to tau pathology. And this is actually my keyword. And then I'll give you some uh, brief background of WF1 gene. This gene encoding a transmembrane in glycoprotein at the ER, and then its mutation can cause the diabetes optic and atrophy, neurodegeneration, and uh, some psychiatric illness. As we know that the protein misfolding and aggregation and the inner ER will trigger the ER unfolded protein response, mainly consists of three branches. It's the PERC, rie one alpha and uh, ATF6 cleavage pathway, and then regulate the downstream UPRG, and then can, mis can solve those mis protein misfolding or send the protein to a proteasome for degradation. And then if you overactivate this ER, UPR, and, uh, or chronic activation, and then you, call, you can cause the neurodegeneration. So my preliminary data, uh, sorry, this is a previous study have suggested that the WS1 interacts with this particular ATF6 pathway to regulate the ER stress. My study has found this tau, particularly co-localized with this WS1 expressing neurons at a very early stage. This is a 14 months, no neuronal loss at all, and a very few granular tau staining yet. And then they also co-localized uh, 
uh, with WS1 expressing neurons in the human tissue. When you look at this, the, the number or the expression level of WS1 between 40 months and 30 months, you can appreciate they're almost gone. And then although they are not totally died, some of them, if you look at the DAPI, and then some of the died, some are just the expression level significantly reduced. And then same in the human brain tissue with ID. So my first aim will look at the interaction between the WS1 uh, and the tau and also ER stress uh, pathway. And the second aim, I try to overexpression to boost the level of WS1 to see whether they can inhibit the ID pathology and uh, how about the cognitive deficit. And uh, also you can do deletion the WS1 and then to see whether they can accelerate the AD pathology or cognitive deficit. So I already have those mouse ready and also have some virus ready for my study. Tau? Those interest questions, I don't think people have very clearly answered for that yet, but people do found uh, tau in the ER and also some in the ER and the mitochondrial contact region. So, you mean those tau protein? I don't know exactly, but this is a majority, the cytoplasm protein, right? And then, uh, I don't know exactly the answer yet because I don't have data to show. Sorry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they are bad shape structure. Yeah. But do they have a kind of process like an endosome can, you know, uptake those tau and then get transported into the vascular and then get in the ER? for the degradation pathway, because ER have a function related to right. So that's maybe one possibility, but I, I don't have data to answer that, yeah. Also, you, um, ER, they also have similar function, they related to proteasome, right, degradation. They may be through similar process, yeah. So the second project is a um, more broadly ER stress and uh, neuronal vulnerability in the neurodegenerative disease. Uh, I still focus on the uh, autonomous disease per, at first, and then but the same approach can apply to different neurodegenerative disease. And then after the project one, I should figure out which pathway are affected in the uh, neuronal vulnerability, especially for WS1 expressing neurons. And then we, we can manip manipulate the specific pathway and then in the specific neurons and to see how they affect the uh, tau toxicity. And this is a neuronal cell autonomous difference in the EIOPR and they, how they contribute to the neurodegenerative disease. And also we, I want to look at the clear the cell non-autonomous uh, EIOPR, whether the, especially the mark, especially the, especially the microglia uh, cause the inflammation and then they, do they directly cause the neurodegeneration or they cause the neuronal deaths and then lead to neurodegeneration. So also the astrocyte, the ER stress directly it cause the neurodegeneration or they interact with the microglia and on neurons and then cause the neurodegeneration. The third part is that Previous studies have suggested that if you block uh, the one branch of the ER stress pathway, particularly for PERC pathway, and then they found significant improvement in the, uh, could reduce the AD pathology and enhance the uh, memory depth, uh, improve the memory. And then, so I want to know uh, what's the mechanism and underlying the neural protection of this uh, intervention, and then can test out what pathway can co-localize with the 
the neuronal vulnerability pathway and to see what pathway overlap each other. And then I can particularly target those pathway and then to, well, in the future do translational study develop a uh, drug of small, small molecules can um, manipulate this pathway to see whether they have a, a neuroprotective effect that can avoid those side effects if you block the uh, PERC pathway. This is a very important pathway for ER stress. If you block it, you have uh, some candidate drugs have shown the kidney uh, side effect. So you cannot do this totally block it. You need to find the, uh, the very, uh, very specific pathway, especially cell type specific pathway to uh, cure this disease. So with that, I would uh, like to thank my mentor, Dr. Karen Duff, for her great support um, and uh, to help me to be independent and get my own PL1. And also her lab members for technical support, as well as Dr. Hasanai and uh, uh, his postdoc guys do the in beautiful in vivo imaging work. Uh, and also thank the Brain Bank for providing the brain tissue for me. And uh, especially thanks Dr. Michele and to school at the University of Cambridge. They do the one for single eye sick data set analysis. And uh, of course, uh, I should thank these two groups. They generously share the data set to everyone, although I get a little bit early before everyone. <laughs> and, and also Peter Davis for providing to anybody. The rest for my collaborators for iDisco and for the new method is the physics I mentioned to uh, Mike and then a few other uh, faculty members. It's a new technique I'm trying to optimize now. And also I get the ER stress indicator line from Dr. Harvey, and then got the WS1 knockout and condition knockout from uh, Dr. Rano and Dr. Cos. Uh, this is my funding thought. Uh, thank you for your attention. I would like to take questions. Yeah, that's a good question. We haven't crossed yet, but because the human tau, the Y type of tau, use, um, usually take a long time to get the phenotype. So, but ideally we should use in that. So that's our next step. Also we get a, a human tau knocking mice from the Japanese group. We'll do the crossing with uh, using that. It's a more physiological condition, yeah. Those data set analysis is from the very the healthy donors. They are around 50 years age. They are not have any tau or abetic pathology yet. So it's a it's very early stage. Those gene signature we identified is a intrinsic, is a early. So that's why we think that may contribute to the pathogenesis of uh, AD or agent, but not like an AD mouse model. We, that is a, the relative late stage. Protease stasis change? You, yeah, yeah, you can, the mouse model, the, this one we particularly focus on, uh, focus on the tau, but you can use in APP mouse model, right? This is uh, another hypothesis for AD field. It's, uh, most people believe that it's uh, uh, like it's an early event but now more people think it's not the tr maybe not the true, true thing because think about how many clinical trials failed now. Most of them target the a beta hypothesis, but none of them succeed. So that's why make people 
try to switch the tau field and also try to other like you maybe generally regulate uh, protein homostasis that have been indicated is very protective in aging and in other neurodegenerative disease. So that's why we want I want to try to combine both. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Really nice stuff yeah. yeah, I did.